In part three of this presentation, I'm going to show you how you can find areas for improvement using the data and once you've found those areas, I'm going to give you some tips on how you can improve. What we've done with our circuit tools analysis software is we've created a very special channel that we call Combo G. And this is a very clear indication of how well you're using the maximum potential of your tires. This is a channel you can switch on and it is along the bottom here. What you will find is with some tyres, you can get more cornering force than you can deceleration. So when you're looking at the Combo G, you're looking for a steadily increasing and smooth line that is indicating that you're using the maximum of the tyres. If you see any dips in the Combo G channel, this means that you're not using the maximum amount of grip that is available for that tyre. Going back to Turn 5 at Portimao, this is Alex's data, and we're looking at the Combo G channel during his deceleration. And we can see there's a, a little dip here, and this is as he's coming off the brakes slightly to do his heel and toe. So we know from the previous presentation that he can improve in this area, but we'll see another little dip just here. This is when he comes off the brakes and he turns into the corner. And this means that he is not blending between the brakes and the steering wheel effectively enough to get the greatest grip out of the tire. So let's look at my data. So my data is in red. This is the Combo G from me, and this is the Combo G from Alex. So you can see that I've braked just a little bit later, but I've started off braking more or less the same amount that Alex is braking, but I've managed to maintain the brake pressure during the gear change. I can maintain a little bit more brake pressure, so I could brake a little bit later if I was a bit more efficient on the brakes. But you can see, as we turn into the corner, Alex has got quite a big dip there, so he's not using the maximum of the tyre. And I've filled in that a little bit. There's still a little, little bit of a dip that I've got as I turn into a corner, so I can also improve in that area. If we look at the differences between the two, I'll highlight them in green. We'll also see that I'm doing something slightly different in the early part of the corner. Now, when you're driving a slow speed corner, you've got to understand the characteristics and the best aspects of your own car. You could have a car with a lot of grip and not much power, and you can have a car with lots of power and not much grip. And what you do, there are subtle differences as you enter the corner. In the case of the Austin Healey, it's got a three litre engine producing over 300 horsepower, and it's running on Dunlop L section tires, which don't give much grip. So, its strength is in accelerating down the straight. So what you want to do is you want to maximize the potential of the car on the exit of the corner. So what that means is you may want to rotate the car just a little bit more early on in the corner so you can straighten it out and get the maximum acceleration out. So we can see in the data here, that's what I've done. Early on in the corner, I've actually used quite a bit of lateral grip from the tires to rotate the car as much as possible. Then I've used less lateral grip on the exit of the corner, which has meant that I can get on the throttle a little bit harder and a little bit earlier than Alex to give me some, a couple of mile an hour extra down the straight, which is worth about half a second. Because if you exit a corner and you've got a lot of steering lock on and you're pulling a lot of lateral G from the traction circle, you can remember that we can't accelerate much. So the car has a lot of power, it's traction limited coming out the turns, so you want to be as straight as possible so you're not extracting too much grip from the cornering forces so you can't accelerate so hard. This is another example of having to blend smoothly from the brakes to the steering, and this is in my Fun Cup car. So this has a lot of grip and not much power, so what I want to do in this situation is carry as much speed as I can into the early part of the corner. In order to do that, I need to extract a lot of grip from the tire early on, so it needs to be balanced. So I need to go in with a balanced steering and brake input. 
And what we got here is the brake pressure, and we can see that I've hit the brakes very hard and then blended quite smoothly, fairly quickly, but very smoothly. I've blended off the brakes whilst turning into the corner. So the combo G channel is a very nice shape, and you can see I've taken a good amount of grip very early on in the corner. So I've got the blend between the brakes and the steering just about spot on. And if I was looking at this combo G trace, I'd say, yes, there's not a lot of room for improvement there. However, not being a pro driver, I can't do that every lap. So let's look at a slightly slower lap. And from this, you can instantly see that there's a big dip in the combo G. So this tells me that I've done something differently on the entry into this corner. And it's fairly obvious I've braked a little bit earlier, realized then I've come off the brakes, but I haven't come off them very smoothly and I'm not using the maximum amount of grip from the tire at this point. A fantastic online resource if you want to take the learning of racecraft and car control a little bit further is Driver 61. It's Scott Mansell. He has his own YouTube channel. He has lots of fascinating, interesting presentations and he very much is an advocate of blending off the brakes and controlling the steering so it's all nice and smooth to balance the car going to the corner because that means you then get the maximum amount of grip from the tyre. So we've worked out where we can improve on the track so what do we do with that information? Well if you see that little dip in combo G nine times out of ten this is caused by braking a little bit too early. Now when you're on the track this is difficult to feel in the car. You select a braking point, you might have a marker at the side of the track, and you hit the brakes there every lap, and every lap you go into the corner and it all feels nice and smooth, but how do you know you're doing it in the best way? Well, by looking at your combo G and looking at that little dip, you can safely say that you need to brake a little bit later. So this gives you more confidence to go out, and after looking at the video, you can see where you are braking, and you can then change your braking point and break a little bit later to try and fill in that little dip. On a slow speed corner, what you might find, and this is fairly common, is you are not turning the steering wheel fast enough. So as you come off the brakes and turn into a slower corner, you have a lot more steering lock. So it's important that you put that lock on quite quickly to build up the forces in line with the brake pressure coming off. So one of the reasons for a dip uh, in the combo G, like the one we saw from Alex at Portimao, is he may not be turning the steering wheel fast enough in that slow speed corner. Also, what you might find is you're coming off the brakes too abruptly. This is also fairly common, and what this means is, no matter how fast you turn the steering wheel, if you come off the brakes fast, there'll be a little hesitation before you're getting extra grip out the tires. When I first drove my Jaguar E-Type, I found that the car was understeering going into a corner. When I relayed this to Callum, who also drove the car, he said he didn't have that problem. So we looked at the data, and what we saw was I was hanging onto the brakes too late going into the corner. I thought I was going too fast, I was getting understeer, so this was telling me that I needed to go into the corner slower, so I was braking quite heavily into the corner. What this actually meant was I was taking out too much grip in a straight line under braking from the tyres, so that didn't give me much lateral cornering force, and I felt this as understeer. But looking at the data, this gave me the confidence to actually lift off the brakes quite a bit earlier and allow the tyres to give me lateral grip by taking off the longitudinal grip. Another common occurrence, if you're not smooth enough, is you can get oversteer on a very fast corner entry. And this is because you are asking the tyre give you a maximum grip while the suspension is moving around and this is because you are not being smooth enough between the blend between the braking and the steering and it doesn't have to be slow but it has to be smooth that's the most important thing. Nowadays one of the best ways to practice and to hone these techniques is actually on the simulator. I've got some simulator data here we had a simulator on our stand at the Autosport show and we were running a competition. A young guy came up to us and asked if he could have a go and uh, he started and I was talking to someone 
Then after about a minute, I noticed that he was driving really well. You could see it, you could sense that he was driving really fast on the simulator, so I stopped to watch him. And it was mesmerizing to watch. He was so fast, but really, really smooth and very, very... After two laps, he had smashed our lap record and that stayed throughout the entire show. So I had a little chat with him afterwards and I said, you know, I, I guess you're fairly used to using a simulator. And it turns out that it's employed by one of the Formula One teams to run on the simulator all day long. And he uses very, very similar techniques to the ones that I've been describing throughout this presentation to get the maximum out of the tire. Out the tire. And it was great to see that in the data because we were recording everything and we could analyze it in circuit tools afterwards. So here is the brake pressure and he comes up and he blends off really quite smoothly whilst building up his lateral G. So he has been very smooth on the throttle and the brake, which has meant that he has got the maximum out of the tire into the corner. So this is a great way of practicing your technique without costing lots of time and money by running your car on the track. And by doing this, you can nowadays be assured that the techniques you've learned on a simulator can also be applied to the track. Looking at this kind of data means that you can spend less time testing because you can get to your answers a lot quicker, not by trial and error, but by looking at the data and working out where you can go quicker. I was driving a new car that I bought last year, and this car has a lot of power and a lot of grip. It's an RS500 Cotsworth Group A, and it's got slicks, and it's got very, very good brakes. So this was a very different concept to the other historic cars or the fun cup I normally drive. So we had limited time in testing, so I needed to get as much out of the data to take that into qualifying as possible. What I could see very quickly was I was losing time on the corner entry by looking at my combo G. Here there's a little bit of a dip, so there's a smooth, small improvement to be made there. On this braking zone, there's a very, very big improvement I can make. I've hit the brakes and then come off them as I've changed gear and coasted into the corner, so there's a big improvement there. But the biggest improvement at all was at the end of the straight. So I'm doing 145 miles an hour on the rev limiter down the straight, hit the brakes, and I'm pretty scared at this point, so I've hit them really quite hard. So I've peaked at 1.2 G, and then, but as I've changed down the box, I've then not pressed the brake pedal hard enough. And this is because I wasn't used to the braking power and maintaining that kind of deceleration in the car. So from these three, I could find instant improvement of over a second a lap just by braking a lot later down the straight and then also braking later at these two points and balancing the entry. But looking at the dips, you can see how much later you need to brake. So here was a little bit, that was a bit more, and that was a lot more. So that gave me confidence in qualifying to go out and brake at different points on the track. And using the video, I picked up different braking points and we actually qualified second for that race from very, very little testing. So this was a, an accelerated way of getting to the answer of how to go faster in that particular car. So if we watch the video, you can see the G-force and you see that reflected in the G-force. So on the rev limiter on the straight, hit the brakes hard and come off to almost half the braking performance that's possible. Braking for the next corner, I can also brake later because I get hard on the brakes, then come off them as I go down the box. So again, I can adjust my braking points to get more out of the tyre as I enter the corner. Fantastic acceleration as you see in this car down the straights. Now this is an interesting example. This is at Alton Park and this is in my Fun Cup car which has a lot more grip than it's got power. This is a friend of mine, David, driving and the week before we'd been testing at Alton Park, we'd set the car up and the handling was fantastic and we were setting some really good lap times. A week later, we're back at testing just before the race and David's reporting that the car has evil handling. On the exit of a corner, it's oversteering massively. We looked at the data and we looked at the video and we could see that he was driving very smoothly and also he was entering the curve at exactly the same speed as he did the week before 
but on corner exit, the car was quite vicious, and I'll show you. So Druid is a very fast corner, requires a lot of very smooth balance, but watch the steering on the exit of the corner. The car bites, it oversteers really quite quickly. Now, we checked his amount of brakes he was putting on, how quickly he was doing that, all the balance of the steering, everything, and we couldn't see in the data what was going wrong. We couldn't see that until we watched the video again. And what we've got on this car, and it's a, another big subject, we've got tyre temperature sensors across the tyre. So we've got various zones across the tyre, we can see what the surface temperature is. From watching the video of a hot lap, we could see that every time he hit the brakes, the rear tyres got warmer more quickly than the front tyres. Of course, we changed the brakes in between the two tests. And on the second test, this had changed the brake bias, the amount of braking on the front of the car compared to the amount of braking on the rear. And what this meant was on entering a corner, the rear tyres were considerably warmer than the front tyres. And in this particular example, as it got to the exit of the corner, the tyres warmed up so much that they went over a certain temperature and lost all their grip. So let's have a look at the data. So we have the rear left tyre here, temperature is in red, and we have the front left tyre temperature in blue. You can see that as we enter the corner, the rear tyres are a lot warmer than the front. By watching the video, you could see this was happening under braking, and we were carrying that temperature into the corner. What it meant around Druids is a big, long, fast corner. The temperature built up, built up to a point where it reached 123 degrees C, and the tyre just gave up all its grip, and that gave you the corner exit oversteer. And it's interesting to know that brake bias on the entry to a corner can cause problems on the exit of a corner. It's something that took us a little while to get our head around, but we found that out by looking at the tyre temperature data. If you want to know more about this particular system, that's available on our website. So thank you for listening to this presentation.